A very good evening to all our viewers. You're watching another edition of the Face to Face on TV One, where we dive deep into the political arena of Sri Lanka. I'm Mariam Gunavijaya, and our guest tonight is the Governor of the Eastern Province and the President of the Ceylon Workers' Congress, Mr. Sandil Thunderman. A very good evening to you, Mr. Thunderman, and welcome to the show. Thank you, and good evening to you. All right. Uh, we start off by asking you this question. Um, you are the first uh, Tamil um, governor of the Eastern Province in the history of Sri Lanka. Now, I believe that when you take the Eastern Province and the three districts in the Eastern Province, that is a very healthy um, representation of a good balance between all communities in the country. What is your game plan when it comes to serving those people of the Eastern Province? Uh, like you said, Eastern Province is a province where you can show the national uh, uh, unity compared better than other provinces because you have an equal share of all the three hmm. communities living there from the singular Tamil and Muslims. Uh, His Excellency President Ranil Vikram Singh nominated me to Eastern Province because we are living with three communities in uh, plantations. Hmm. So, and uh, our re our uh, history of relationship with the singular community, with the Muslim community, with the Christian community and the Hindu community. So his president believed that we can do a good job in Eastern Province. And uh, as I took over the charge of the Eastern Province, Eastern Province is a highly sensitive province, though they are equally placed, but it's highly sensitive, even for a small uh, uh, communal issue, uh, they get very, they react very aggressive with the previous history of this country where during the war time as well as after that during the 2019 Easter bomb blast and all that Eastern Province has been one of the major uh, player in these incidents the province uh, those uh, some of the people from those provinces so as I took over I feel that 90% uh, uh, of the community between the three four communities living there there's no issue that's 10 percent where they want always a communal uh, issue to be uh, maintained uh, throughout the year they want it like that so they pick up different uh, kinds of various issues offending another religion but I've what said, is the intention behind that no they because they're used to that they're used to a culture like you know maybe dominating another religion or you know offending another religion they're used to that you know they so uh, you can't say that you know they are doing it on uh, purpose they are they are grown up that way i feel like that so 10 percent of all the communities there they always try to offend the other religion so i as soon as i took over i said that you know any amount of prayers you'll do any amount of religious activities you do but do it in the place where uh, the, that religion is being followed. Don't go to another place where that religion is not followed and force them to do. Don't do that. So there where you get the communal clashes and offending the other religion. So after I took over, yes, I had uh, initially few incidents where people were trying to offend the other religion. So whatever it is, maybe it can be singular, Tamil, Muslim or Christian. I'm very strong that I shouldn't allow uh, religion to overlap, uh, overlap another religion. So I have taken strong steps and you know, people have been angry with me for that, especially the 10% of the people. They always uh, try to show that when you support uh, the singular people, the Tamil people try to say that, you know, I am, uh, though I am a Tamil person, I am supporting the Sinhalese uh, like that. So when I support the Sinhala people, uh, sorry, when I support the Tamil people, the Sinhala people, uh, certain people quoted out that, you know, I am from the Tamil community, so I support the Tamil. So then when I support the Muslim, both of them get together and say, you know, uh, this man is uh, supporting the other side. And then when I support the Christian, so, you know, these are multiple allegations which they keep. But I feel I know none of the religion says to destroy another religion. So I believe that all religions uh, believe in God and love and care and peace and people who are following that are not uh, following the principles of their religion. Mm, so you are you saying that since you took up uh, the governorship of the Eastern Province, your top priority has been to you know ensure that there's unity among uh, the people in the Eastern Province? Uh, can uh, Instead of saying unity, if I'm going to say it's unity, I'm going to create more problem again yeah. and again within them. So that one person advises the other person what to do. I can say that uh, uh, more than unity, I feel that one religion shouldn't overlap the other religion. 
So, so I, what I have you done to ensure that that doesn't happen? Uh, yeah, but there are a lot of incidents where we have put, we have intervened and put a full stop. You know, like even from uh, even in Tamil and uh, Muslim areas where there have been some uh, uh, Buddhist shrines being constructed where the people have objected, we have intervened and stopped. And same way, there have been some uh, uh, former LTT supporters uh, like Mr. Dilipan and all that whose uh, uh, memorial uh, procession were taken in single areas which provoked the singular community. So where we have uh, strongly objected those kinds of uh, processions going into the singular community area. Like that I have uh, uh, and one religion uh, encroaching on other religions lands. All that we have uh, totally we have put a full stop. But in spite of that I get few complaints and we are very strongly acting on it. Hmm. So that's your take on the Eastern Province. Now, uh, Mr. Thunderbun, you're also the president of the Ceylon Workers Congress. That is a party that has uh, traditionally uh, been um, advocating for the Sri Lankan Tamils of Indian origin. And uh, now when you took up this governorship in the Eastern Province, uh, how did you plan on, uh, you know, balancing both the places and, uh, you know, sh dividing your responsibilities accordingly? No, no, actually, even uh, when you take us a being a party leader, hmm. if you are taking a responsibility of a ministry, that ministry subjects it works throughout the country. So you have to dedicate most of your time for that subject also. So uh, earlier, like how I was doing my party works, now with this new advanced technology with the social media and you know mobile phones and things like that, I think a lot of issues are addressed over this uh, digital uh, technology. Hmm. And only very few you, uh, issues where we have to be personally present. So for which I am uh, taking time and doing those things. Apart from that, uh, uh, I think that uh, I don't find it difficult to manage both. So you're balancing responsibilities. Uh, uh, did you decide to take up this uh, position with the intention of contesting for an election in the future? Are there plans like that? No, I will be going back to my electorate to contest in my election because I represent a party and I'm a leader of the party. Hmm. So I should definitely contest in my area and uh, make sure that you know my party scores well. So. And and uh, this, but uh, till you know elections come, whatever job you are given, you will have to do it in a better way for mm. the development of the country. I strongly believe that if Eastern Province, if the three religions don't overlap one and one religion, they can set an example to Sri Lanka. So, so I thought, let me take that uh, hard task and uh, make it sure that all of them uh, have a very good friendship in the coming days. So, Mr. Thondavan, you said that uh, you will go back to your people, go back to your party. That's right. But what is the plan that your party, the Ceylon Workers' Congress, has envisioned when the elections come up? What are you all going to do? No, no, we, we have uh, visionary plans which didn't start from today. Hmm. You know, our party has started in 1939. Hmm. And from that, we had different, different stages. We had different, different plans. Uh, at one point of time, uh, we all became overnight stateless people. So we, at that time, you know, our intention was to get citizenship in the country. Then after we got citizenship in our country, our intention was to make sure that our job is secured. So we get a job with pension and EPF and ETF and all that. So then after that, you know, then we then we wanted to get into the national stream, like uh, the teaching sector, health sector, and law and order, judiciary. So then we started going into that. Then after that, now we understand that uh, we have two things which have to be looked uh, with priority. One is uh, 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 land and house for a person who is being living for generations in a small 10 by 10 room. It's a big dream for them. And uh, we think that the, it's the responsibility of the Ceylon Workers' Congress to make that dream come true. So we started uh, that from 1985 during my great-grandfather's time, late Saumya Murthy Thondaman's time. We continued and uh, uh, we are still on ongoing because, you know, we have around uh, 2 to 3 lakh uh, people living in line rooms where you can't do it overnight. We just need as time goes, we need time to get money in the budget and whatever government comes you know and keep building those things same way we also think about a long time uh, vision of for university coming into uh, up country so when a university comes into up country we feel that you know it motivate more children to go to university and otherwise you know they they have maximums in up country you can see schools you can't see universities so we want to bring down a university as a thing which 
is which is presently very much needed apart from that then we also look of uh, alternate uh, jobs uh, now because people are everybody coming out of a level and going to university we have to have more jobs in up country otherwise they will start migrating so we are looking of more job e establishment and also uh, apart from tea we are looking at empty lands in tea to have integrated crops system where we'll have some other more additional crops which will give an additional revenue to the uh, tea plucker so we, we, we are looking more self employment we have we are having discussions with a couple of embassies so that we get our people uh, good job a decent job for them to do now mr thondaman uh, you mentioned about tea and i'd like to point something out now uh, tea has been sri lanka's main agricultural export commodity for over a century if i'm not wrong and especially during the tenure of the cwc and uh, the people in the plantation sector are people from uh, sri lankan uh, tamil indian origins uh, these are the people who have fueled and run this entire sector for the longest time but uh, still we see these people in line rooms we see them still being daily wage earners uh, like you mentioned they were stateless for some time uh, why do you think this issue prevails especially since the cwc is a party with pavan if i'm not wrong you all have been in almost every government uh, since 1939 so why why is this still an issue no not 1939 we didn't have citizenship for a long period of time mm. so from 1980 only we been in power and in between also there have been uh, different other parties also have been in power mm. so now you see uh, you take up you know a government a country can provide a good health system mm. a good road a good uh, education system and things like that but this system was bought by uh, british uh, the british people bought this system who they talk about high about uh, human rights and all that <laughs> during colonization they bought us and they put us in line rooms it was constructed by them and it was their ideology okay who now they talk about human rights and you know all Uh, rights whatever the rights in the world they project out saying that it should be followed it's not being followed and all that if the british had settled us in a decent way i don't think that burden today would have come to the sri lankan government so like what i said you take uh, hamban dot there have been several presidents there from ranasinghe premadasa from honorable mahinda rajapaksha from gotabaya rajapaksha there have been several pre presidents from different sides of the government but still you know Uh, they would have done good hospital good education good uh, road system but individually picking up people and you know uh, developing them is it's a, it's a very difficult task so and uh, silon workers congress has been in the cabinet and has uh, contributed in the development sector like first with health education and these are the thing which we concentrated first like how i said you from time to time you know we have to change our ideology according to the needs of the people so first we felt that you know the basic needs like education if we give a good education we strongly believe that the economy will build and develop mm. but in sri lanka there is only a very limited sources of people can be selected in the university the rest you don't have private universities and you don't have uh, the system like other nations now if you take india every every home has a graduate because there are a lot of private universities they don't get selected in the government they go to private and they complete their studies but here they don't have that opportunities so it is not only the silon workers congress though we are encouraging for more education and activities but it's the government policy we must have more private uh, hmm. uh, institutions for educational institutions which will help the people like you know the vulnerable people sometimes you know uh, financially they are not very strong to go for uh, 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 external universities overseas so when we have private universities in sri lanka it will still help them more private universities in the sense i mean it like a full time uh, uh, this thing now even we have this uh, open university mm -hmm. so that is supporting a lot for the plantation students but it has got limited class limited enrollment you don't have multiple enrollment even you want to put 10000 people you i don't think you will be able to put for a course but you have a limited of 400 500 things like that so those things are being uh, uh, well manured among our community and you know most of our community people are trying to now they understand that you know education is the only thing which will change the community so they are working on it very strongly right so you're saying that when the education sector and the education issue for the up country people are sorted uh, this will help them come out of this bubble they are in that's right right 
Okay. Um, I'd like to quickly touch on the relations that we have with India as well, because if I'm not wrong, earlier this year you were in Kerala and you met uh, Chief Minister Vijayan, and uh, you all had discussed about uh, the infrastructure development and uh, dual tourist uh, destinations with Kerala and the Eastern uh, Province. Um, we know that you all have had discussions, but were you able to secure any financial aid for the country? Uh, yeah, I, the, the state governments can't uh, have any financial aids, but mm. the central government of India, I had my first preliminary discussion with uh, Dr. Jay Shankar, hmm. the Indian uh, External Affairs Minister, and they were around almost uh, several projects which were incomplete in Eastern Province. <laughs> so I felt that you know if those are not completed, the the amount of money invested by uh, our government also goes to a waste if those are not completed. Hmm. So and due to this right now economic crisis, and uh, I think there wasn't much finance to complete all these projects. So I, on a special note on request, with the help of the Indian ambassador here and the Sri Lankan ambassador in Delhi, we prepared a good uh, proposal to complete all our projects. And I met him in Delhi and I got a financial aid of 2,371 million. Hmm. rupees to complete all my projects. So I'm very strong. So that is that for all the unfinished projects in the Eastern Province. Unfinished and new projects right. in Eastern Province. So I'm very str strong and confident that you know that will help to at least uh, the amount what we would have investment uh, we would have also invested around 2000 million. So you know it's it's, it's a win-win situation where otherwise the 2000 million what we invested goes to a waste. So uh, so I, I got that uh, organized and same way then uh, I also had uh, a couple of projects is coming like this uh, now this renewable energy project projects coming to eastern province and then uh, eastern province becoming an energy hub then also this oil uh, uh, tank pipe comes coming from india that will all help to stabilize the fuel security Yes. as well as the cost of logistics fuel coming from different parts of the world to Sri Lanka and you know coming through pipes I think it's a one-time investment but you know it will help us to maintain the fuel security in Sri Lanka so getting that organized then apart from that uh, when uh, our honorable uh, president visited India and Honorable Prime Minister in India, they signed an agreement to develop Trincomalee port. So I'm very strong that when a port develops, the country develops. We have a lot of transit shipments which can be uh, used Trincomalee port for that development. And I believe that before Colombo Harbour, Trincomalee port was the natural port and which uh, during the King's period that was the only source of entry to Sri Lanka for big vessels. So we are having assets which we are not utilizing. So I feel that we can utilize and we can make more uh, now for example if we have bigger vessels coming mm. they don't have to go up to India what we are saying is let them park in Trincomalee we will have smaller vessels which will transport the whatever required goods to India otherwise the entire vessel goes and comes back so there even India will make a win-win situation we will also make a win-win situation so things like that and also we are I had a chat with uh, uh, the Kerala chief ministers. I, whenever I have a discussion, I have a win-win discussion. I don't mm. go f asking for one-side help. So what my suggestion was, I said that we have a huge uh, Sabri Malay uh, uh, pilgrim coming to uh, India, more mm. than 25,000 people coming from Colombo every year. So I said the, we will uh, promote the events. They come, they will go to a lot of temples. They will also stay around. So like that, uh, like we are doing for 25,000 people coming over there. Uh, we want your pilgrims also to come here. So then why don't you have a your extended service? They have a very good Ayurveda service. So your extended service in Sri Lanka, they have throughout the world clients. So I said if you can have it in East, a lot of people who can come to Sri Lanka don't have to come again to India. They can you know get that in East and go. And same way we are also looking of uh, exploring the mineral sands in eastern province. We have a huge deposits of mineral sands. So for that also I've asked India's help. I gave a suggestion to India. I said you give me a line of, like what I said it's a win-win situation whatever I negotiate. I asked for a 500 million dollar uh, a line of credit. I said if you can give us that we will put a value addition plant until that 500 million dollar is over we will export you sand. How successful is that? I'm just trying to tell you, okay. uh, finish it off. So once we uh, complete our line of credit with the export of sands, the asset of that uh, factory comes to Sri Lanka. 
so then you know we we have uh, ma mining sands for billions of dollars available in sri lanka but to put up 500 million dollar worth of a value addition plan right now sri lanka is struggling so my suggestion was you give us the financial support or set up us the factory we will repay you by sand so me the quantity whatever the investment is done it's all valuation it's world market you know you can't undercut and all that whatever world market goes we give the amount of quantity to them and the rest we uh, the factory belongs to us and then we right now we export it i, I i'm not sure if i'm not wrong i think around 300 to 400 dollars or something but once when you do value addition to titanium slag and things like that from 2000 dollars to 4000 dollars it goes depends on the world market so you know i believe that you know that uh, a same product which we are selling for 300 dollars if you value add it can go for 2000 dollars i think we are almost doing 10 uh, 7 8 uh, to 9 times more so so we need support like that so i also when i met i went to japan also had a discussion with some japanese agencies also i said even at least through jica if you can support us to put a value addition plant the government will make a very good revenue uh, we have a raw material which is just lying on the beach we only need a machinery to separate it and export so these are things like you know we are very keen and also about the uh, Uh, agriculture lands we have a huge agriculture lands in eastern province which is fertile and which can be utilized i have also had ch- a couple of chats with few uh, trade organization in middle east because they are uh, basically they are more of deserts so i said if you can uh, eastern province is uh, well connected with saudi and all that if you all can uh, uh, take around 500 or 1000 acres and do production agriculture production only for your supermarkets that will give a huge uh, job revenue to uh, the local farmers so you know we are working on a lot of things so i but i think i'm just four five months there mm-hmm. so within five months we are doing our best right so um while you speak on all the developments you have for the eastern province you are the president of the CWC uh and you earlier in the interview said that you will do whatever to go back to your people so what have you been able to work with india to bring back for your people in the up country no no uh, i think the the housing project which was given by sri lanka government from 1985 was hardly 1000 houses a year mm. so uh, in 2008 9 after the war we myself and my late leader honorable armon tondaman we had a long discussion and i said that only if we have external support we will be able to speed in the process mm. so then i have we got an appointment with madam sonia gandhi on a personal note and we had a chat with her and she convinced and gave us uh, she was convinced with our request and she gave us 4000 houses to start with so then you know with 1000 we had a 4000 add on then after that we had couple of meetings with uh, the present prime minister honorable uh, narendra modi the same way myself and my uh, late leader we had lot of discussions with him and then in 2017 when he came down to sri lanka he agreed and ge- agreed to give 10000 houses so and you know we also di- discussing with lot of ngos and lot of other people and trying to pull in uh, to add on to sri lanka government so that it reduces the burden of sri lanka government so you know that money can also be used for some other parts of sri lanka so we are trying to do lot of things like that and uh, apart from that uh, now with india we are negotiating for the university hmm. so the the syllabus will be done by ugc the be- land will be given by sri lankan government the building will be done by indian government so it's a tripartite program so right. we are working on that i think minister jeevan tondaman is uh, uh, because he is the minister for uh, estate housing and yeah. uh, village uh, through his ministry we are trying to work with the education ministry a cabinet paper a joint paper to get this thing going um <laughs> We've uh, also seen you have a few successful meetings with the uh, Chief Minister Stalin uh, before you took up governorship of the Eastern Province, if I'm not wrong. So, uh, have you all been able to work out anything for the people through that? No, uh, through uh, with uh, M K Stalin, uh, yeah. Chief Minister of Tamil Nadu. I have a long time relationship with mm. him. I think um, uh, uh, I think for more than twenty twenty five years. Mm. So, uh, meeting him is uh, even <laughs> even after taking the governor or beginning. Yeah. I just meet him on a personal note. The main issue what we discussed was one was regarding the refugees in India, the Sri Lankan refugees. He is uh, he is now making arrangements by giving them a housing program and things like that. So, and what are the issues? I I had. brief chat with him and uh, and i also said we are we also keen in repatriating them back to sri lanka if hmm. they are interested to come so we are we were working on that then also another one was the fishermen issue 
which is commonly being addressed because of uh, the short distance between uh, Rameshwaram and uh, Talimanar, you know, the, the boundary is a very yeah. short distance. So mostly the, the Indian fishermen use these troll, trollers. So they, when their seas are empty, they uh, they come into the waters of Sri Lanka, you know, when you go catch fish, you know, you, there's no boundaries in sea, you know. So they just, you know, gear up and try to catch when they don't see anyone here and there. Mm -hmm. Then once uh, this, this repeatedly happens in Sri Lanka, you know, deep sea trawling is being banned. Mm -hmm. So I also suggested him if, uh, if we can have a joint program. Like you know, uh, uh, one is in the uh, 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 like you know for more f uh, breeding fish, fish breeding on the Rameshwaram belt. So when there's more fish available, I don't think these people will tend to cross and come. So that if we can also see uh, on our side how we can handle this on humanitarian grounds and try to bring this a settlement. Otherwise, you know, this is being happening from the day uh, this, uh, I think, uh, after this war was over. Now, this is very frequently happening. When the war was there, I don't think there was much movement of both sides uh, because Navy was very much patrolling on that side. So now I feel there's more of these movements. So I thought, I think, uh, it's better we uh, get this sorted on a dialogue. Right. Anything on the educational front, Mr. Thunderman? Uh, educational front, uh, Tamil Nadu government is giving us scholarships as mm. well as the uh, Indian government is also giving scholarships and we are sending a lot of children to study. Okay. Do they end up staying there or do we no. get them back? But the people <laughs> Because who you were talking about migration issues and... Uh, no, you the know. people who went during uh, the war time, mm. that is in 1985, 86, 89, their children are born and brought up there. Hmm. So I'm not sure how ca how comfortable they are to come back here, but the children who brought up and brought up uh, born and brought up here, when they go back they come back. Right. They don't uh, when they go they come back they don't stay much. I just have one last question for you. Um, when we speak of uh, Sri Lanka's uh, uh, priorities when it comes to regional and international politics and relations, what do you think uh, our country can do better when it comes to uh, working with India since a lot of your people are related to, you know, are linked up with that particular issue? No, relationship with this India has been for generations and generations mm -hmm. and decades of years and years. And uh, during uh, different king's time, there have been different types of relationships which has maintained. And then after, during British colonization, a different way being maintained. Then after that, during uh, a couple of uh, regimes of different presidents, it's been maintained in a different way. Uh, the relationship between in India and Sri Lanka is always like a brotherhood because, you know, uh, Buddhism comes from uh, India. And uh, for India, always Sri Lanka is like a smaller brother because, you know, it, uh, the Indian Ocean, we are the start of the Indian Ocean to India. So for both, we need each other. And uh, I always believe that, you know, it should always be in a win-win situation for both people. Right. So we're doing Not, things right. Yeah. We shouldn't be win-win situation to one country. It should be a win-win situation to two countries. So then the relationship is genuine and goes for a longer time. Right. Thank you so much for being with us, Mr. Thank Tundaman. You. And that's a wrap of uh, this edition of Face to Face on TV1. Thank you for watching. Good night. TV1. TV for life. People's Platform. Good evening and welcome to the